hello guys and welcome back to my channel today i'm very excited to be doing a video about one of my favorite australian convicts james hardy Vo. i know you're like favorite australian convict anyway he's one of my favorites <laughs> okay so i'm going to tell you a little bit about his story if you've never heard of him buckle in he's such an interesting character and while I'm doing it, I'm just going to show you the um, Australian convict records. So I'll show you the records that I've got for James Hardy Vo. But the collections are amazing. There is so much that you can learn if you have a convict in the family. The great thing also about James Hardy Vo is there is also a mystery about his life. So make sure that you watch through this video so that you can find out the mystery and please go ahead and solve it. So all of you genealogy sleuths, get your notepads out and get ready. So for today's research, I used Find My Past. I'm very excited to announce that I am now part of the Find My Past Global Ambassador Program. And later on in this video, I will provide you with a discount code in case you would like to subscribe to Find My Past as well. So stay tuned for that. But uh, first of all, let's just get into James Hardy Vogue. As far as I can tell, he is the only convict that was transported to Australia not once, not twice, but three times. <laughs> I know, can you imagine? Um, so you're like, how? How could you be transported three times? But I'm going to explain. He's just so interesting. So he also published the first dictionary in the Australian colony. Um, which was the Dictionary of Flash Language, which is the language that the convicts use, sort of their slang sort of terms. And he wrote this dictionary for magistrates and people up, um, sort of higher up in society so that they could understand what the convicts were saying. <laughs> um, so that was the first dictionary in the colony. He also wrote his memoirs, which is invaluable because the first-hand account of a convict is extraordinarily rare. So he's a very kind of unique character. He was born in 1782 in Surrey in England and his parents were Hardy and Sophia. His father was a butler um, and his mother was the daughter of an attorney. So James was mostly raised by his grandparents when he was younger and he went to boarding school. He had a really good education. He was very well taken care of. He was certainly not sort of like most of the other convicts, poor and uneducated. He had all of the advantages in life. He even had the opportunity to go to Oxford to study if he wanted to, but he turned it down. So as a young man, he worked a few jobs. His first job was as a linen draper. He was an apprentice and he also worked as a clerk in the law in, in a law office. And he also did a stint in the Navy. Um, he seemed to just sort of jump around sort of careers, though. He couldn't seem to settle on anything. And he did get himself into some gambling problems. He... Um, I think because he was sort of um, really educated and supposedly kind of a gentleman, he got away with quite a lot. He would sort of pretend that he was going to pay a debt, like he would borrow money and he would gamble and he would sort of disappear here and there. He got away with stuff for a long time. So in 1800, he was caught stealing from his employer and he just luckily got off on that charge. but. Later that year, he stole again, he stole a handkerchief and he was sentenced to seven years transportation. He just escaped the death sentence just because the value of the handkerchief was just slightly lower than the death sentence kind of cut off. So um, seven years transportation is still a pretty harsh sentence for that crime for us. But so Vo came to Sydney in 1801. He sailed on the Menorca and there's... In his memoir, he actually talks about when he got on the ship. So I'll just read a little tiny excerpt for you. Having entered the ship, we were all indiscriminately stripped according to the indispensable custom and were saluted with several buckets of salt water thrown over our heads by boatswains. After undergoing this watery ordeal, we were compelled to put on a suit of slop clothing, our own apparel, though, in, though good in kind, being thrown overboard. We were then double ironed and put between decks where we selected such berths for sleeping, etc., as each thought most eligible. Another fascinating excerpt from his memoir is from when he first arrived in Sydney and he dealt with Governor King, who was there at the time. I'll read you this too. 
Well, Mr. Vo, what were you sent here for? Sir, I had the misfortune to be acquainted with a person of bad character who in my company committed. Mr. Vo, come to the point at once. I don't want you to come round here and then back again and around the other way. Recollect, Mr. Vo, you are not at the bar of the Old Bailey now. Come to the point, sir. Come to the point. I asked you what you were sent here for. Sir, I was charged with picking a gentleman's pocket, but though your excellency may doubt my assertion, I solemnly assure you I was innocent of the fact. Oh, I dare say, Mr. Vo, very innocent, no doubt. Quite innocent, I dare say. So, the long and short of it is, you were sent here for picking pockets. I confess, sir, that was the charge. What have you been brought up to, Mr. Vo? Sir, I've been chiefly employed in the law, but I must profess to be a clerk in general. Pray, sir, what office were you in last? Sir, the last gentleman I served was Mr. Preston, in King's Bench Walk. That I very much doubt, sir, that I very much doubt, sir, that I very much doubt, Mr. Vo. I'm sorry your excellency has so bad an opinion of me. I assure you, sir, it is the fact. Well, Mr. Vo, I shall send you to a place where your roguery will soon be found out. I hope not, your excellency. I trust you will have. Well, I hope so too, Mr. Vo. I hope so too. I hope so too, sir. But mind, I only give you a caution. Take care of yourself. What's also interesting about this exchange is that Governor King eventually came around to liking James. He, um, he sent him up to Hawkesbury to do work, and he did well for a while, and then he got into trouble again for forging Governor King's signature to, um, to get stores, so he would just sign off on things that he wanted, and he was quite good at forging the signature, so he eventually got caught, and once again forgiven. Governor King ended up bringing him into sort of, um, a clerk kind of position. He... He seemed to really have the gift of charming people, so it's like despite his criminal tendencies, he must have just been a charming kind of guy. And because Governor King liked him so much, he actually gave him a passage home to England on the Buffalo in 1807. So Governor King was returning to England and he let him come back with him. He um, James Hardy Vo was a tutor to Governor King's children on the boat. And yeah, so apparently their relationship soured a bit towards the end, but he got home. And so James Hardy Vo once again got back to London. So while he was back in England, he got married to Mary Ann Thomas. Um, the way he described her in his memoir, it sounds like he was talking about his soulmate. He absolutely adored her. Mary Ann Thomas was a prostitute. Um, but I guess he, he, when he talked about her, he said that her behavior was, it was like she was coming onto the straight and narrow. She was doing really well. Um, but he, on the other hand, was continuing with his naughty ways. He was getting back into gambling and it's just, it was almost like a compulsion. He, he got to see his parents and his grandparents again and he was thrilled and you know, that seems really great. And he got set up in London again with a job, but he just couldn't help getting himself into trouble. So I'll give you one more little story from his memoir. And this is from a night that he took his wife, Mary Ann, to the theater. In the beginning of the month of October, my wife, who was far advanced in her pregnancy, accompanied me one evening to the Drury Lane Theatre and the performance being over we were descending the staircase from the box lobby when I attempted to possess myself of a gentleman's pocketbook but by some accident he suspected my design and publicly accused me therewith. Unfortunately several other gentlemen who had been robbed in the course of the evening being on the spot and beginning to compare notes agreed unanimously that they recollected my person as being near them about the time that they were robbed and did not scruple to insinuate that I ought to be detained and searched. My poor wife, who had stood all the while at a small distance, much terrified and agitated by various emotions, which so much affected her, that though we lived within 200 yards of the theatre, had scarcely power to walk home. And we had no sooner quitted our kind conductor, who attended us to the door, that she than she fainted away, and was for some time insensible. The consequences of this untoward event were still more seriously afflicting, for her tender constitution was not proof against the shock, and she was the next day prematurely delivered of a male child, which, however, only lived eight hours, 
and was subject to infinite regret to us both. Poor Marianne. It's so sad. And they didn't have any more children. And very soon after that, James Hardy Vaux got convicted a second time. This time, James Hardy Vaux was using one of his aliases. So he actually used at least two aliases that we know of. This one was James Lowe. He also went by the alias sometimes James Young. So under the name James Lowe, he was sentenced um, at the Old Bailey for stealing from a jeweler's shop in Piccadilly. Um, initially, once again, it was a death sentence and luckily he had it downgraded to transportation for life. So this time there was no coming back. This time he was there for life. And by the way, just so that you know, it was extraordinarily rare for convicts to ever go home to England. Even if they served their seven year sentence, most of them could not have afforded passage home or they didn't want to go home by the time they were done. So he reached Sydney again in 1910 on the ship Indian and he was first assigned to the Hawkesbury and then to a town gang in Sydney. Um, he was then convicted of another crime. It was receiving stolen goods and he was sent to Newcastle, which was a further um, sort of more harsh penal colony. In 1814, he returned to Sydney and was caught trying to escape on the ship, the Earl Spencer. He was flogged and returned to Newcastle again. It was during this time that James decided to write his memoirs. He claimed that he did it because he was instructed to, but those memoirs are amazing. I think he loved writing them. <laughs> I highly recommend giving them a read. They're actually freely available on the internet, so you can just Google it and it'll come up. I think it's Google Books or something. You can also buy copies of it. It's actually the first full-length autobiography that was written in Australia and it gives just so much insight into life in London and the penal system and just yeah it's an incredible book highly recommend. So in 1818 while Vaux was in Newcastle he got married to Frances Sharkey another convict she was an Irish convict um, this was during a visit by Governor Macquarie. A month later he was returned to Sydney where he was once again used um, for his clerk services and he ended up receiving a conditional pardon and getting a pretty good kind of clerk job. Just a few years later, Vaux got married again to his um, housekeeper Eleanor Bateman who was another convict. Um, what's interesting about this is his wife, Frances, was still alive at the time. <laughs> so, don't know whether they just went their separate ways or what happened. So here is the application to marry for a convict. As you can see, he's also used a um, alias again, James Lord or Vo, which is obviously kind of unclear. Maybe that's how he got away with getting married a second time. But uh, yeah, here's the original record. So we'll just find him up the top there and then zoom it in. So you can see James Lord and then it's got sort of Vo next to it and their ages and the date and Indian is his ship, life sentence, conditional pardon, clergyman. As far as I can tell, he didn't have any children. I could not find record of any births. So um, the child that Marianne lost back in England was presumably his only child. However, go ahead, you genealogy sleuths, and see what you can dig up. James Hardy Vaux then um, managed to escape and he made his way back to Ireland. There he was convicted for a third time <laughs> under his alias James Young. He was convicted for passing forged notes. So he was returned to Sydney again as a convict, <laughs> um, this time aboard the ship Waterloo. So. Um, when he returned to Sydney, he was actually recognised and they realised that he was actually James Hardy Vaux and so he was <laughs> returned to his life sentence that he was supposed to be serving. Now there's a bit of a mystery in this last section. So the last few mentions that we can find in the records of James Hardy Vaux is that he was convicted in 1839 of assaulting a young girl. Um, I would love to know the details of this one because 
he is clearly a notorious sort of criminal who is always stealing and always up to mischief but he's never been convicted of any kind of violent crime and he's never been as far as I can tell involved in anything like that so I don't even know how credible this one is but he went to jail for two years he was released in 1841 and then as far as I can tell that's the last that anyone ever saw of him there's no death record there's no more like records that suggest where he could have gone um, even under his aliases can't find him did he escape and make it back home again to England or anywhere else um, did he remain in Australia? Did he change his name again? I don't know. He's a mystery. So if you're a good genealogy sleuth, you go for it and you find him because not just me, this is like nobody knows this one. So it's a big mystery. Yeah, so that is the amazing and interesting James Hardy Vaux convict who was sent to Australia three times and he wrote two amazing books. Yeah, he's just such a fascinating character. So um, I highly recommend reading his books and please follow up on uh, finding him. If you can do better than me, if you can figure it out, that would be a great one to solve. So just a little word on convict records. They are incredible because convicts were so sort of closely monitored and, you know, everything that they did went into the record. So when they committed their crime, that was all noted down. Their court records, their, they were often put on um, into prison hulks. They, their transportation records, their arrivals, uh, arrivals, <laughs> their arrivals, their, um, once they were in Australia, there were convict musters. They were always checking up on them. Where were they assigned to? Um, if they got any kind of ticket, ticket of leave or a conditional pardon, they um, had to ask for permission to get married, so there were requests for that too. There are so many records for convicts that, in a way, you're lucky to have convicts in your family because you've got somebody who's been traced and recorded and you've got so much information about them. It's fantastic. Okay, so that about wraps this story up, but um, I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed hearing about his life, and I hope that you um, also enjoyed seeing all the records that Find My Past has. They have actually quite a lot of Australian records, as well as obviously heaps of other stuff. So if you would like to give um, Find My Past a try, go ahead, subscribe. Here's my discount code. I'm going to put it on the screen. Let's say there. I'll also put it into the description box so you can get yourself a discount. All right, thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell so that you're updated of all of my future videos. And I will see you soon in my next video. Bye, guys.